former Melbourne City Councillor who levelled accusations of sexual harassment at former Lord Mayor Robert Doyle has taken to Twitter to defend her side of the story. Tessa Sullivan has expressed her frustration at media reporting of the alleged incident, using the social media platform to put forward her perspective. Mr Doyle has denied all allegations made against him. He stood down from his role as Melbourne's Lord Mayor last month. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. It's now nearly three months since scandal erupted at Melbourne Town Hall when Councillor Tessa Sullivan resigned after alleging she'd been sexually harassed by Lord Mayor Robert Doyle. And it's now two months since the Herald Sun splashed this front page story, which it suggested would blow up the complainant's case. Lord Mayor probe bombshell. Councillor's text sparked dramatic twist in harassment scandal. The Herald Sun had been given a number of Sullivan's private text messages sent after the most serious sexual harassment had allegedly occurred, which the paper described as friendly and affectionate in tone, citing one that referred to Doyle as Dahl, another that called him a good friend, and yet another in which she thanked him for his support. But most damaging of all to Sullivan's case was this front page photo of her in a bikini, which we have blurred at her request, under the headline... Rob. I'm so lucky to have you. The picture was in fact an innocent holiday snap she'd sent to a number of colleagues, while the headline was a text sent three months later in an entirely different context. But inside the paper, some of the Herald Sun's copy was just as grubby. Please, please, pretty please. Tessa Sullivan wouldn't take no for an answer. And as if that weren't bad enough for a case already under investigation, the Hun added another, quote, twist two days later, telling readers... The former councillor registered the trading name Tessa Doyle ten years ago. The implication being, presumably, that Sullivan was obsessed with the man, years before she even met him. Stupid, eh? And as the Financial Review soon revealed, Doyle was in fact her mother's maiden name. Yet the Hun refused to issue a correction, even when this was pointed out, and it also refused to back down over the texts, despite threats of legal action. But last week, Sullivan went public with her fight, sending this tweet, now removed, to Herald Sun editor Damon Johnston. Disgusting how you cut and pasted these texts to look like I asked for it. Victim blaming at its worst. And on Friday, she followed up with an interview in The Age, claiming she'd been painted as a woman who was begging for it, and adding, my whole life has been ripped apart. And going public tipped the balance, because last week the paper suddenly gave in and removed the contested articles. For weeks, the Herald Sun's editor, Damon Johnson, had defended the paper's coverage, telling The Guardian... We have broken many stories revealing allegations against Mr Doyle, and we have sought to give readers the arguments from all parties as far as possible. So why the change of heart after two months of stonewalling? Johnson told Media Watch... As an act of good faith, we agreed to remove them. Well, it's good they've done so. Just a shame it took them so long. Because whatever the final judgment on Sullivan's allegations, and a special meeting of council may make it public tomorrow, those stories clearly crossed the line. And while we're on the subject of crossing lines, let's catch up with the latest hacking scandal news. I would just like to say one sentence. This is the most humble day of my life. It is now almost seven years since Rupert Murdoch delivered his humble apology to Britain's Parliament for industrial-scale illegal hacking by the news of the world. But hundreds of millions of dollars later, the saga is still not over. Actor Hugh Grant has settled a phone hacking case against a major newspaper company in Britain. The Mirror newspaper group has admitted that reporters broke into his voicemails over a 10-year period to get stories. The 57-year-old will be paid a six-figure sum, which he plans to donate to a campaign group called Hacked Off. The latest wave of payouts by the Mirror Group last month and the Murdoch's Sun and News of the World in January may or may not be the last. But last week came dramatic new allegations of illegal activity by yet another Murdoch paper. Hundreds of telephone uh, interceptions, hundreds of bank um, interceptions, um, utilities have been through mortgages of stolen rubbish. I've, uh, I mean... Uh, I'm afraid the list is endless. From 1995 to 2010, former British actor John Ford was paid up to £40,000 a year by the Murdoch's flagship Sunday Times. He says to steal or blag people's private information. 
As Byline.com reported in an exclusive investigation, Ford was engaged... To unlawfully obtain phone bills, recover ex-directory phone numbers and penetrate private financial material such as banking and mortgage data, by his own admission, several email accounts were successfully hacked. He did each job to order on the instructions of some journalists at the Sunday Times. Byline checked out Ford's story for five months, matching payments from the Times to pieces he'd worked on for the paper. This list of receipts from October 2004 shows Ford being paid for up to seven stories a week and earning £5,000 in a three-week period. So, who was he told to go after? It appears the confidential records and personal information of at least two former Prime Ministers, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, were obtained. The leader of the opposition, William Hague, was also a victim. And why was he spying on them? Rarely, says Ford, for stories that were in the public interest. Ford says he fraudulently accessed William Hague's bank account on and off for a month for no good reason. The phishing exercise was a bid to find out if the former Tory leader had bought a present for a female friend. The story on Haig was never published, but Ford speculates, worryingly, that such information may still have been valuable. A piece of compromat was always a useful thing for management to have in the safe, ready to deploy at any key political moment. In the light of the Barnaby Joyce affair, in which politicians' private lives are suddenly fair game, that is a shocking reminder of how the media can misuse its power. However, the Sunday Times has denied any wrongdoing, saying in a statement that did not address the details of Ford's allegations. The paper strongly rejects the accusation that it has in the past retained or commissioned any individual to act illegally. The new claims of illegal activity by a Murdoch newspaper come only days after the British government announced it's closing down the Leveson inquiry into media standards. Amid cheers from media proprietors, jeers from campaigners for tougher press regulation and dismay from Justice Leveson, who says the full truth about the unlawful behaviour of Britain's media is yet to come out. But it may not be the end of the story. Former Deputy Prime Minister John Prescott, allegedly targeted by the Sunday Times, told the BBC... So I'm taking legal advice. Are these stories true? Did this Sunday Times act in the way that he now said he did? And former Prime Minister Gordon Brown is calling the police to open a new investigation, telling the media... This new evidence shows that even when under oath, what was then News International misled the Leveson inquiry. I am now calling for police to investigate this criminal wrongdoing. So, watch this space. A whole new chapter beckons. Although you may not read about it in the News Corp papers. But now to a farewell. 18 months ago, Macquarie Radio launched Talking Lifestyle a radio network built on sponsored content, ads and a smattering of talkback, which was what you could hear if you switched on 2UE in Sydney and Magic in Brisbane or Melbourne. And if you don't know what lifestyle branded content sounds like, here's a taste. On Talking Lifestyle. On all the time. Talking travel for Flight Centre. Best in the air and everywhere. Sarah joins me once again from Flight Centre. And Sarah, France is a country with loads of different things on offer, isn't it? Thanks for having me. And absolutely, France really accommodates for all different travel types. And if travelling to France wasn't your thing, how about owning a racehorse? It's a premium yeah. horse with some of the best trainers in the world. So that can give you some confidence if you, if you are going to invest in something like this, that you've got quality people managing your horse and, and the That's process. It. Yeah. Whilst the price point is revolutionary, um, the quality is at the very premium end of the market. Yep, interviews wrapped around a product or a brand and paid for by the advertiser. And that's before they played the ads. When Talking Lifestyle launched, we said we doubted if anyone would listen. But Macquarie Media boss Russell Tate clearly didn't listen to us, telling Mumbrella... I didn't see what was on Media Watch and I don't care. I've got too much to do without watching that drivel. But we're sad to say we were right, because despite the network's presenters doing their best, the axe has now fallen. Macquarie Media's Talking Lifestyle to be replaced with sports format. Talking Lifestyle is to shut down. And one look at the ratings reveals why. Listeners switched off by the thousand. As Macquarie's Russell Tate confessed in a staff email... In short, Talking Lifestyle has not been able to deliver the audience numbers which we were hoping it would reach. And how bad were those numbers? Atrocious, frankly. In a year, the Brisbane audience went from 73,000 to 24,000. And it was even worse in Melbourne, where they started with 166,000 and ended up with 48,000. 
Two Yui in Sydney also lost, falling from 209,000 to 164,000. So, having lost the audience, where next? Seems the answer is talking sport, says Russell Tate. It will be replaced by a sports format, networked across the same three stations. So, how viable is the new game plan, given how much sports coverage is already on offer? Radio consultant Steve Ahern told me to watch... It could work, certainly in Sydney. But then added... I don't think Brisbane is big enough for a solo sports station, and Melbourne already has a sports station, SEN. Well, we wish them luck. It's surely got to be better for listeners than ads all day. But former 2 UE star Mike Carlton, who's long been scornful of the station's management, says it will be an uphill battle. Any idiot can run a station with a stable of established stars. Jones, Hadley, Mitchell, etc. They run themselves. All you have to do is handle the defamation writs, a cost of doing business. It's much tougher trying to pull a station up from the bottom. Requires real creativity and lots and lots of money. And lots of money, we would guess, is something they will not be keen to put at risk. But now, it's time to celebrate. Egg, I'm so happy to be back for another year. Happy birthday. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. you. She is the oldest person in the whole of Australia. Oh, I'm very thankful that I'm still here. That was WA's Today Tonight, celebrating the birthday of Australia's oldest person and Perth local Peg Vivian, oh, something they've been doing for the past seven years. And next morning, Seven's rival Network 10 also wanted to celebrate. Meet Peggy. At 112 years old, she is the oldest person in Australia. Isn't she gorgeous? Look familiar? Yes, that's Seven's footage, filmed in Peg's house with the watermark hidden under the banner. And it's even got Seven's reporter still in shot. And not only did Ten use Seven's footage without permission or attribution, but the script also had a familiar ring. Born in Scotland in February 1906, ten-year-old Peg moved to Perth with her brother and sister. Born in Scotland in February 1906, Peg moved to Perth with her brother and sister. Peg never smoked, hardly drank, never drove, so walked a lot. She has never smoked, she's hardly consumed alcohol and walked a lot because she never learnt to drive. She's going to the pool till 108. Yep. Um, doing yoga till 98. Even going to the pool, would you believe, until she was 108 and doing yoga until 98. A very <laughs> happy birthday, Peggy. Amazing, eh? But disaster for 10 because they didn't copy one vital detail, which is the oldest person in Australia is called Peg. And Peggy, who got all of 10's birthday wishes, is actually her daughter, a mere spring chicken at 86. Not surprisingly, Seven's reporter Mark Gibson was a bit pissed off and took to Twitter to protest. Hey, Studio 10, just wondering why you stole and ran our exclusive pictures of Australia's oldest person on her 112th birthday. It's been 17 years since I worked for Channel 10. Which elicited this contrite response from Jessica Rowe. Sorry, Gibbo, I'll get to the bottom of it. And if you've been watching or reading the papers, you'd know that Jessica Rowe is leaving Studio 10. Tash, I love you. Joe, I love you. I love you too. And, you know, and, um, oh, it's been such a journey, hasn't it? <laughs> it's been yeah. Wonderful. But despite the rumours, she has not been sacked, and certainly not for pinching stuff from Today Tonight. And you can read more about tonight's stories on our Facebook page or our website, including a statement from Macquarie Media. You can also catch up with us on iView and contact me or MediaWatch on Twitter. And don't forget, Media Bites every Thursday. But for now, until next week, that's it from us. Goodbye.